pi session. I'm going to put a question mark. It's either going to be, what was the first time, 9.15 to 10.30? 9 to 10.30? 30 or 4.15 to 5.30. And sort of big question marks to be determined, hopefully by email announcement tonight. And I'll try to post it on the website as soon as I find out the exact time. Tomorrow morning. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So no question. But but she <laughs> right. She does normally what Wednesday mornings. Then it's Tuesday afternoon. Then then this is no question. Tomorrow, four fifteen to five thirty. Thank you. F I. Thursday. Okay. Thank you. It's good that we all know where each other is, I guess, <laughs> yeah. or scary, one or the other. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, a couple of quick comments on the quiz coming back. First of all, the homework assignments are worth 10 points total. The quizzes are worth 5 points total. So quiz total is 5 points. So the number that you see at the top of the page sitting by itself is out of five. Uh, the only two things that came up on more than, let's say, two papers were these. Uh, in your sort of preamble to what a group is, you can call it step zero. A group is, you know, a binary, blah, blah, blah. Um, saying that you have a closed operation on a group is the right idea, but it's not the same as saying a that you have a binary operation because binary operation includes the fact that you've got a function which automatically includes that the operation is well defined. And if you just say some sort of binary operation or some sort of map from G cross G to G, you've missed a little bit of the structure of what you need there. So binary operation is what you need to say there. If some of you just said is a map or a rule that gets you from G cross G to G, you need a little bit more than that. And you, in numbers two and three, you have to make sure that you get your quantifiers correct. Uh, the existence of an identity element means there is an element called E with the property that if you hand me any other element and you combine the other element with E, you get the other element. In other words, you start with E, and the element E that you've written down works for every other element in the group. That's completely different than saying, if you hand me an element in the group, that you can find something that behaves like E for each individual element. Okay? And conversely, when you talk about an inverse element, you don't want to say, well, if I start with E and any A, I can somehow, there, there's some sort of uh, inverse for, the, the inverse element, conversely, is specific to the particular element that you start with. So the preambles and the appropriate quantifiers in Parts two and three of the definition of a group are different. You start with the element E in step two, and each element in the group works for it. Conversely, in part three, you start with any element A, and you can produce for it an element A prime that works. You're not claiming that for each element in the group, there's somehow a universal or an inverse element that works for every element simultaneously. The inverse statement is a statement about if you hand me an element, I can find another element in the group that works for it. If you were to hand me a different element of the group, I would have to perhaps, well, I would have to definitely write down a different element as its inverse. Okay. So just, I mean, it seems like a subtlety, but in the end, the point is that you sort of need to start parts two and three slightly differently. Okay. All right. Questions? Comments? Questions? David? On the website you said to the graphical representation, do you want that in addition to proving? Yeah, so on questions 15 and 16, presumably you could write down a formal proof of whatever is or isn't a group without any sort of pictures drawn. But in addition to you writing down a proof, I want you to tell me what the heck it is you're talking about. And the way I want you to tell me what you're talking about is by drawing pictures of what it is you're talking about. Because these are functions, all right, so what do they look like if you have a graph? Here? So yeah, you can think of the extra statement as, in addition to what you would have already done in the question, do this too. Okay. All 
All right. Yeah, another question. Lindsay. Um, Extra problem, right? Okay. Oh, I see. Right. So the question is, uh, right, because we talked about this notion of isomorphism, even though I didn't include that word in the extra problem, I don't think. But, uh, uh, yeah, whatever you learned in class that would be appropriate, you know, to sort of use in support of an answer to the extra problem is totally appropriate. Just say, we, we saw in class that this is the same as this or isomorphic, or that we can relabel the elements of this to get to that. However you want to phrase that is fine. Good. Right? Any others? Very nice. Yeah, Lindsay, sure. <laughs> um, explain the identity element. Yeah, sure. It's an element that when you combine it with any other element, <laughs> gives you the other element. And that's and, and the key is it's it's up to you to decide whatever the operation is, whether it's addition of functions or multiplication of functions or composite, whatever it is. All right, what function? would somehow, when added to or multiplied by or composed with any other function, give the other function. So it's just sort of a matter, just sort of this little mantra you got to get. What function? No function. No function. Yeah. Ronnie. Um, the, sig the significance of n equals 2? Um, the significance of n equals 2, um, let's see, did I have the, um, yeah, yeah, this worksheet, yeah. Yeah, For number 14, number, yeah, 14 section. Yeah, so Lonnie, the, the question in, four, in uh, number 14 of section 4.4 .4 asks you to analyze all the n, di n by n diagonal matrices that have diagonal entries 1 or minus 1. Well, you can do that for any n. I only want you to do it for the one particular situation where n equals 2. Contrast the, the. No, there's only three groups that you have to analyze here. Okay, and and the group that you'll get has four elements. So I'm missing the question. I mean, the, if, if you do section four, problem fourteen, and you only restrict to n equals two, then you'll get a group, and that group will have four elements in it. Okay, so that now you throw in the list of groups that you want to analyze. And now here's another group. No, sir. What, there is only one group that we're describing. The case n equals 2, that group will have exactly this many elements in that particular case. Yeah? All right, let's chat after. We'll get there. Okay. 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 Uh, yeah. So. Because it's been a week, let me bring you quickly back up to speed as to where we were when we left off a week ago. We were talking about the notion of subgroup. And the idea was once you've spent a lot of time working to show something's a group, then oftentimes you can find within that group other groups, groups that somehow live inside the given group. I made a big deal out of that particular way of finding new groups because later on there will be other ways of finding new groups once you've established some existing group. Okay, this is just one way, look inside. It turns out various groups come up easily if you look inside known groups. We looked at a bunch of examples a week ago. It turns out also that if you're trying to establish that some set is really a group and that set happens to live inside something that's already known to be a group, in other words, that set could potentially be a subgroup, then it's somewhat easier to show that a subset is a subgroup than to simply somehow produce a group out of thin air, as we've been doing up until now. And you only have to invoke what's called the subgroup theorem. It says to show that a subset is a subgroup, then all you need to do is check that the 
binary operation is closed. In other words, A star B is in the subgroup whenever A and B are in the subgroup. You have to show the identity elements in there, and you have to show that if you grab something in the subgroup, that its inverse not necessarily exists, but does exist because you're living inside a group, but actually also lives in the subset. So there is a thing called the subgroup theorem. That's in your notes. I won't repeat what the three properties are, but the point is that there's a relatively easy way to determine when something is or isn't a subgroup. I mean, if you can show, for example, that there are two things in the proposed subset so that when you combine them and you don't get something in the subset, you're done. You don't have a subgroup. It will be the case, folks, well, it, it's rare in mathematics, but it's the case, at least for this course, it's probably true in all, it's almost always true that if you're going to be asked to show that something is a subgroup, there's exactly one way to do it. It's you use the subgroup theorem and you just click through the three things that you have to do. There's not any sort of, well, I'll choose this tool or that tool or the other tool. There's one tool, it is the subgroup theorem. All right, what we looked at last Wednesday were examples of specific groups. Excuse me, Diana. Were examples of specific groups, and inside those specific groups, we identified some subgroups. Like inside GLN, R, we identified what we called SLN, R, okay, that's fine. What we're going to do today, at least for a little while, is ask the question, suppose you hand me any group. I don't even tell you what it is. I don't tell you if it's finite or infinite or abelian or not abelian or anything. It's just here is a group. Are there automatically some subgroups that you can build inside the given group? The answer turns out to be yes. We saw two, I call them silly examples last Wednesday these things we call trivial subgroups. So the idea here is, given any group G, any group G, we can define uh, special subgroups of G. And we looked at this already. Example, the trivial ones the group itself, or just the identity element sitting by itself, there are two subgroups. And you notice I didn't tell you what group it is. Just start with any group. Finite, infinite, a billion, not a billion, doesn't matter. Here's another example. This one's a little bit more interesting. I'm not playing it up as the most important example of a subgroup. I am playing it up, though, because I want to show you how to go about proving, in this sort of generality, how a subset of a group might be a subgroup, simply by going through the subgroup theorem. Okay, so here's the example. And the example is given in terms that hmm, subsets are typically given in terms of. I'm going to hand you a group. I'm going to describe a subset, not by telling you what the form of the elements in the subset are, but by telling you what property the elements in the subset have. And then to determine whether or not something's in the subset, you simply determine whether or not the property is established or can be shown in the element that you've got your hands on. So here it is. For any group G, define the following, and this is another sort of artifact of the German influence on early group theory. Z of G, Z of G, this is called the center of G. The German word for center is centrum, Z-E-N-T-R-U-M, so that's where the Z comes from. And here's the definition of the center of G. It's the elements, let's call them little z in G, with the property that if you do the binary operation with that element and any other element for every The definition of the center in words is this. You're in the center if you have the property that when you take any other element in the group, not just one, but every single one, and you do the binary operation in this order, that you get the same thing as doing the binary operation in the other order. Now you're thinking, you mean the group's a billion? No, I'm not asking that the group be a billion. What I'm asking you to do is, in some sense, look at those elements that behave like they're a billion with all the other elements of the group. Just before we start, for example, if I hand you the particular element E, E has this property because if you take E star G, you get G, regardless of what G 
you start with by property z. If you take g star e, you get g. So if I look at the particular element z equals e, I've got an element in this subset. And the claim is, claim, what we'll prove is that the center of g is a subgroup of, remember this notation, subgroup means, or subgroup is denoted by, take the subset symbol and just put a little sharp point on it to make it look like a less or equal sign. I'm going to click through what each of the three steps look like. If you need to do this for a homework problem or something similar to it, I'll ask you to write out more details than I'm about to write out here in class. Well, look, if you're going to convince me or prove for me that the sum subset is a subgroup, there's only one tool that you've got at your disposal. It's the subgroup theorem. So, okay, use the subgroup theorem. Subgroup theorem says I have to convince you of three things. Step one, I have to convince you that if we take two things in the subset, so let's see, what have we called the things in the subset? We've called them little z. That makes sense given the name of the subset. So let's call two things in the subset. How about z1 and z2 are assumed to be in the subset, then so is whatever the binary operation gives me. That's what you have to show for, for step one. Step one of the subgroup theorem. If you take two things in the subset, convince me that when you combine them, you get something in the subset. Well, folks, I haven't told you anything about the form of Z1 or the form of Z2, but what I have told you something about is the property that an element in the group has to have if it's going to be in the subset. The property is you have to pick any other element in the group. You have to perform this binary operation in this order. Then you have to perform the binary operation in the other order, and you have to convince me that the two results are equal. So to show you or to prove that this is the case, what we have to do is we have to show, well, we have to show that this is in the subset. In other words, we have to show that if we take this element, that's the element now, and we combine it with any other element in the group, that what we get is that other element in the group combined with the element in question. Folks, I don't care if the element you're interested in showing in the subset is called H, if it's called T, if it's called diamond or square, or if it happens to be called Z1 stars Z2. That's the thing that you're trying to play the game with. And playing the game means take it, combine it with G. That's what I've done here. Take G and combine it with it in that order and convince me that you get the same thing. If you can convince me that that equals that, then the conclusion is that this thing is in the subset. That's all. Any questions before we do the computation? And once you set up what you have to do, typically the computation is pretty straightforward. So let's do it. Well, let's see. What do we know? We know, and the reason we know it is because we're told that each of Z1 and Z2 individually are in here. We know that Z1 star G is G star Z1. We know that because Z1 is assumed to be in the subset, and that's what it means to be in the subset. And we also know that Z2 star G is G star Z2 by the given information, uh, property or definition of Z of G. That's what it means to be in there. So now let's do the computation. Well, I'm using a good connecting word. Here's what I want to show. Here's what I know. Let's see how we show it. If I do Z1 star Z2 star G, the goal is to convince you that that expression equals this expression. Let's see what we can do. This is, oh, by associativity, binary operation in a group is associative. This is Z1 star, Z2 star G, which is, any ideas of what to write down next? Z2 star G is G star Z2. So this is given information. Z1 star, we're replacing Z2 star G with G star Z2. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to say something about Z1 and G. Sure, I can do that. Let's use associativity again. Star Z2, which is, oh, I know something about Z1 star G. It's G star Z1. 
which is associativity again, G star, Z1 star Z2. So look what we've shown. So we've shown that if we do the left side here, that by writing down half a dozen steps or so, we can melt it into the right side, so check. So instead of spending more time on this example, I'll simply say, all right, we've now completed step one of the subgroup theorem for this particular subset. We've shown that it's closed under the binary operation. In order to complete the subgroup theorem, in order to complete the proposition that this subset really is a subgroup, now I have to show properties two and three, show that E has this property. Do it home. Show that if A has the property, then so does A. And I'll let you think about, really the hard part is folks just writing down what the heck the task is. Here the task is, I'll give you a hint, show that, well, what does it mean to be in the subset? It means it has the property. The property is that if you take the element in question and you combine it with any other element, that you get the same thing as if you had done that for all G and G. Am I too far over here, Karen? Or is that showing up? Okay. That's what you have to show, because that's simply what it means to be in the subset. Similarly, here you have to show that if you have an element that has the property A star G is G star A for all or for every element in the subgroup, then you have to show that A inverse has the property. Well, having the property is a non-issue to write down. For all A. So here you simply have to show that this is always true, and in the third part you have to show that if you assume A has the right property that puts it in the subset, that you can somehow conclude that A inverse has the right property. I'm not claiming that they are totally obvious or even one step. You might have to work you know, at a sort of an effort level similar to the one that we used to prove part one, but it, the task is now relatively straightforward. So here is a subgroup of any group, regardless of what group you start with. Of course, I'm not claiming that this is always some new subgroup. It might be the case, for example, that if you look inside a specific group and you write down what Z of G is for that specific group, Z of G might actually be G. That's fine. In fact, I'll mumble under my breath and let you think about this, and we will talk about it in about a week or so. If Z of G is G, it means that every element is in the subset. It means that every element in the group has this property. It means that every element somehow can be switched in order with every other element, which means the group is abelian. So if you have an abelian group, then Z of G is G. In fact, if you have a not abelian group, then Z of G is not G might also be the case that Z of G is E. So I'm not claiming that we're always producing a new subgroup, but we're at least we're always, regardless of what group we start with, writing down a subgroup that we can describe. Okay. All right. Questions? Let's continue the theme then. The theme is I'm going to write down an arbitrary group or any group, anything you know to be a group, and we're finding subgroups in there. The trivial ones are always in there. The center is always in there. The center is just... Again, as I mentioned, maybe not the most important example that comes up, but one that can be used as a good uh, exa example or, or tool to show you how to use the subgroup theorem to verify that a subset really is a subgroup. What we'll look at now are subgroups that are significantly more important in the structure of trying to describe what the group itself looks like. And these are usually called the cyclic subgroups, or if you're in England, the cyclic subgroups of a given group. So here's the definition. Definition is this. Start with any group G. So G, any group. That's the theme here. And what I want you to do is pick any element you want. Any element, let's call it little g in capital. And what I'm going to ask you to do is write down a subset of the group, and what we'll do is show that that subset is actually always a subgroup. And here's how you get that subset. First of all, I'm going to give it a name. The subset is denoted by, you take whatever element is that you've started with, I don't care which one you've picked, just grab your favorite one, 
and you put it in diamond brackets like this. And here is its definition. You take all of the elements inside the group. So it's, I guess I'll call it X in G with the property that either X is the identity element or X is G star G star star G as many times as you want. Let's call it I times for any I. So it's either G itself. If I ask you to take G star G star G one time, by default, I just mean you to, or ask you to write down the element G itself. If I ask you to do G star G twice, it's fine. If I ask you to do G star G star G three times, it means just do G star G. Or X is G inverse star G inverse star star G inverse. I'll say J times. And here, I and J, I put a big parens around this. Here, I and J are any positive integers that you want. So here's the subset of the group that I want you to write down. Automatically, just by default, throw in the identity element. Throw in everything that we're going to call a power of G. So throw in G, throw in G star G, G star G star G, blah, da, 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 as many times as you want. If you're asking, you mean infinitely many times? Well, in theory, yes. But after a while, this collection of things might start repeating itself, and that's fine. And then finally, take the element that you've started with, find its inverse, and then do the same process with its inverse. Just keep pounding its inverse with itself as many times as you need. And when it's all said and done, just sort of step back and say, all right, that's the subset I'm interested in. Okay. Proposition, regardless of what element in the group you start with, you always get a subgroup. For any group G, for any G, and any element that you choose to start with, and any G in G, this set that I've just described here is always a subgroup of G. Remember, this is a, is a subgroup of notation. And before we prove this, I'll give you the notation. This is called the cyclic. And I said the word cyclic before almost as a joke, but it turns out it's not. I mean, if you go to an international meeting and you hear international mathematicians or mathematicians not from the United States talking about these structures because they've learned typically British English, they'll call these cyclic groups. Cyclic or cyclic subgroup generated by G. And that's what this particular subgroup is called. If we need to be more specific as to what the group G is, sometimes we'll call it the cyclic subgroup of G generated by little g if we need more specificity, but typically we don't. All right. Folks, it's a proposition of exactly the type that we've been looking at for the last, well, day and a half. Show that this subset is a subgroup. You have one tool at your disposal, the subgroup theorem. Just pound through the three steps. So prove. I'm not going to go through all three steps, but I'll indicate that there are three steps to go through. Step one. Step one's a little bit squirrely, but you know, I won't go through all the details. It says if you take an element of one of these three types and you mash it together with another element, of one of these three types, that the result is an element of one of these three types. Okay, so presumably there's like a lot of choices. If you take an element of this type and you start with an element of this type, do you get an element? Sure. I mean, if you take E and you start with G times G or G star G star G, you just get G star G star G. I mean, starring E with anything certainly isn't going to change it, so that's a non issue. If I star one of these with another one of these, if I take G star G star G 12 times, and then I take G star G star G 18 times, and I star them together, then I get G star G star G 30 times or something. I don't care how many times. You just get another element of the same form, of the correct form. Same thing with the real sort of interesting one is if you take an element of this type and you start with one of this type, do you get something of the correct type, correct form? And the answer again turns out to be yes. You know, let's say, I'm just giving you the intuition here. If I have 10 of these, and I have, I don't know, 7 of these, 
and you star that with that, well, you're seeing a bunch of things that look like G star G inverse, which is the identity. So it disappears. So for example, if I do, for just an example, so warning, I am not playing this up as a proof. I'm just giving you an intuitive example as to what's going on. If I take G star G, something like this, star G, I don't know, 10 times, and then I ask you to star that with something that looks like the G inverse thing, you know, G inverse star G inverse star star G inverse, I don't know, seven times. What's the result? The result is, so if you star those, I'm leaving out all the associativity words, but everything is associative. I regroup like this, oh, those kill each other, you get the identity. Then I group those together, get the identity. Get the identity, get the identity, get the identity. Oh, but let's see, I've got, what, three more here than I have here? So this turns out to be G star G star G. It's the right form. All right. So that's what's required to do in step one. Not too bad to do. It's a little bit tedious. Step two is obvious. You have to convince me the identity elements in the subset. That was easy. There it is. Step three. Step three is not too bad either. You have to work a little bit. But look, if I hand you G, then I know that its inverse is in there. If I hand you G star G, then guess what? Its inverse is G inverse star G inverse. So it's in there. So it's just sort of by definition. You've rigged things so that everything that's in there also has its inverse in there. Okay? So three is all sort of a check, although there's some work to be done here. And so that's presumably what we'd need to go through to show that this is a subgroup. And again, I'm not going to go through all the details. I've given you some idea of what's required or what sort of detail work you'll need to do by showing you this example. The formula that I'll write down, though, for you is this. It turns out use, and I won't prove this either, but in effect it's just the generalization of what I showed you here to give you an intuitive idea to more general expressions. Um, if we denote, and this is just notation. Uh, if I take G and I put it with a little zero in the upper right-hand corner, well, you're used to thinking of that as something to the zero power, and you're probably going to react, oh, that's just one. Well, for us, the thing that somehow behaves like one is the identity element. So deem this symbol to simply mean the identity element. Deem the symbol G where i is an integer, to be, I mean, this makes sense, huh? Yeah. i times, i times where i is a, one time, where i is an integer, and i bigger than zero. So folks, I'm not defining for you what g to the 1 half power means, or what g to the square root of 2 means, or anything like that. What I'm defining for you is what g, quote unquote, raised to the i power should mean. And remember, folks, this definition of what g to the i power means is completely dependent on the group that you're looking at, because it completely depends on what the binary operation is, which is a little bit notationally unfortunate sometimes, because if it happens to be that the binary operation in the group that you've got in hand is plus, then g to the 7 would mean g plus g plus g plus g seven times. Okay? So you've got to be careful. Even though this is suggestive of multiplication, it really is dependent on the specific binary operation of the group. And let's see, if I denote by this, g to the minus j is g inverse star g inverse star star g inverse j times, okay, so j an integer and bigger than zero. So j is bigger than zero, so I've got g raised to a negative power. Then what you can show is that it's always the case that if you do g to the i star g to the k, and I don't care if i is positive or negative or zero, if k is positive or negative or zero, that you get the exponent rule. That looks like the exponent rule for multiplication. Things are behaving like multiplication. Uh, behaving like simply means as a product of our notation for groups, anything you can typically prove for multiplication 
inside the non-zero rationals or something like that, you can go ahead and verify. So, I mean, look, the point is if I take g to the tenth star, the notation for this thing would be g to the negative seven, then the result should be g to the ten minus seven. And we'll, we'll use this for the, for the remainder. I won't go ahead and prove all the details, but the proof roughly looks like this would be fine. All right, so here then is another way of looking inside a thing that you know to be a group and finding more subgroups. And again, we're not claiming that whenever you do this that you necessarily get something different than the group itself or whether you get something different than the other trivial subgroups, the identity subgroups. It's just a way of producing subgroups. So let's do some examples. Example. And we looked at some, it turns out, at the end of last time. Let's see what those look like. So let's look at, actually, it's funny, funny line. This is the group I want to look at for this. So here is the group from the extra set of problems that gets generated from Section 4, problem 14, n equals 2. Uh, let's call this group G. It's the group 1, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, yeah, 0, 0, oops, wait a minute, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, sorry, and minus 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And we looked at this at the end of last week, uh, it is the collection of two by two matrices having as, two by two diagonal matrices having as entries either one or minus one. All right, so let's play this game, this cyclic subgroup generated by game for the elements of capital G. Let me just go through each of them. Let's call this one E and this one A and this one B and this one C. So if I look at the cyclic or cyclic subgroup generated by E. So this means you throw in E by default. Just put that in first. Then you put in, you know, the element itself, which in this case happens to be the element I've already written down, so I don't need it again, so it's already there. And then you put in that element. It's already there. And you put in, oh, and then you put in but it's already there because the inverse of the identity is it. So, hey, in the end, all you get is, so the cyclic subgroup generated by the identity element here is just the identity element. And in fact, folks, there's absolutely nothing special about this group. It's always the case that if you look at the cyclic subgroup generated by the identity element, you just get the trivial subgroup consisting of the identity element itself. That's the side effect. How about, let's see, if I look at the cyclic subgroup generated by A, Again, by default, write down E, just part of the definition. Then write down the element itself, think that's G to the 1. Then write down A star A. All right, what is A star A here? Uh, the op operation here is multiplication. You multiply this thing times itself, and you get E. So that's E. So I don't need it because I've already written it down. And then let's see, A star A star A. Well, A star A was already E. So that's A. So I've already got it. And hey, if I keep doing more powers, quote unquote, of A, I either get E, A, E, A, E, A, and it sort of cycles back and forth. That's where we get this word from. Oh, but let's see, what's A inverse? Is A because why? Well, because if you star A with A, you get E. So that's already A, and that's already in there. So I don't need it. And you know, A inverse star A inverse, that's A star A, which is E, but I've already got it. And so in the end, all you get is E and A. So there is a, well, there is the subgroup. I don't need to prove anything because it is the cyclic subgroup generated by A. And we've shown that the cyclic subgroup thing is actually a subgroup. Okay. And we can play the same games here. Similarly, if I take the cyclic subgroup generated by B, the details are exactly the same. The cyclic subgroup generated by C, the details are exactly the same. 
So it turns out, folks, that if you take any one of the four elements in this group and you look at the cyclic subgroup generated by it, none of those four elements actually give you the whole group back. One of them always gives you the trivial subgroup back, but neither one of the non-identity elements or none of the non-identity elements actually gives you the whole group. Okay, that's fine. But this is just something to note. Here's another example. Uh, yeah, this will be an example that I won't spend a lot of time on because we did most of the details last Wednesday. The example is Z6. So it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 with addition mod 6. And let's look at, for each of the elements in here, look at the cyclic subgroup it generates. Well, hey, we just noted in the last example, if you take any group and you start by taking the identity element and you look at its cyclic subgroup, you just get the trivial subgroup consisting of the identity element. If you do anything to the identity element, it doesn't change anything. How about the cyclic subgroup generated by 1? Well, you're supposed to put 0 in there by definition. You put 1 in there. there. Then you put 1 star 1 in there. So I'm going to call it that. But let's see, the operation here is addition mod 6. So that's 1 plus 1, which is 2. And then you put 1 star 1 star 1 in there. And you put 1 star 1 star 1. And you put, well, and then if you put 1 star 1 star 1, if you do it six times, you get 6, which is 0 in this group. So you get back to where you started. And hey, if you do it again, you get this one and this one. What we'll look at in more detail next Monday is, it turns out, folks, when you do this process, as soon as you get back to the identity element, you're done. Exactly right. And you've got all the elements. And so once it turns out we get to zero again, because we've already got it, not only do we don't need it, we don't need to go any further. We've got the entire cyclic subgroup. In fact, here, there's no way to get anything else because we've got everything in the group. So this happens to be the whole group, which is something that didn't happen in this previous example. So we found a specific element that has the property that when you look at the cyclic subgroup generated by that element, you actually get the whole group. So that just makes this group somehow structurally different than this group, even though they both have, no, I won't say that, sorry. Okay, cyclic subgroup, I won't say because it's not true, it's probably the same. Um, cyclic subgroup generated by two, it's the same idea, throw in zero, throw in the element itself, throw in the element star together with, its el with itself, then three times two plus two plus two, is six, which is zero, and we're done. Cyclic subgroup generated by three, zero and three. Hey, three plus three is already zero again. <coughs> Cyclic subgroup generated by four, throw in zero, throw in the element itself. Mm -hmm. Throw in four star four, four plus four is two, good. Then four plus four plus four is 12 which is zero, mod six. Hmm. So it's interesting. So here we actually get the same subgroup, but starting with different elements. Okay, that's possible. How about, let's go ahead and finish the example. Well, you throw in zero, you write down the element, then the element start with itself. So five plus five is 10, mod six is four. And five plus five plus five is 15, which mod six is Five plus five plus five is it. And then zero. Hmm. So here we actually get the whole group as well. Okay. Question? David. Ah, yes. Question. So David's question is, is there a name for elements that do that? And the answer is yes. In fact, almost taking one step backwards from that question, there is a name, and I'll give it to you right now, for groups that contain elements that do this. Okay. So this group doesn't have any elements that sort of work. 
This group doesn't contain any elements with the property that if you look at the cyclic subgroup generated by it, you get the whole group. That group does. And here is the sort of verbiage that distinguishes between those two possibilities. Uh, a group G is called cyclic or cyclic in case there is at least one. There is at least one, I don't care how many, element little g in the group so that, or with the property that, when you look at the cyclic subgroup generated by g, you get the whole group. The definition of what the word cyclic or cyclic group means. So notice now we've used this word cyclic in two technically different but obviously very related senses. We use the word cyclic in the sense of the cyclic subgroup generated by an element. And now we've used the adjective cyclic on a group. The group is cyclic if, and we can use the original language, if there exists an element in the group for which the cyclic subgroup generated by that element is the whole group. And in this case, when this happens, any such G is called a generator of the group. Or a G. So let's just go back and look at some verbiage then. If I look at this group, so this group then is not cyclic. And we showed it was not cyclic because we specifically went through every element in the group. There was only four of them. We pounded out what each cyclic subgroup was generated by each of the elements, and we never got the whole group back. So it's not cyclic. Uh, just as a piece of verbiage, when we talk about this group, if we, instead of using the notation with matrices, use the E, A, B, C notation with the table that I gave you last time. We typically call that group Z, and I'll give you the historical reason uh, maybe today. This clock is right, yeah? Or relatively right? Okay. Um, so what we've just shown is this group called Z is a group that has four elements that's not cyclic. Okay, that's fine. Quick remark, and somehow students seem to get these backwards or get confused about this. Folks, this group V is an abelian group. You might say it's multiplication matrices. Yeah, but remember when we have diagonal matrices, multiplication turns out to be commutative. So even though this group is commutative, it turns out to be not cyclic. Oops, that's all right. Uh, Z6 turned out to be a cyclic group. So Z6 is cyclic. And in fact, it has two different generators. It has both 1 and 5 as generators. So the element 1 is a generator for Z6. The element 5 is also a generator for Z6. Okay. So what we're about to do is look at specific examples of groups that are cyclic or are not cyclic. The first thing that we're going to note, though, is the, pro is the following property. It turns out proposition, proposition, if... Uh, G is a cyclic group, then necessarily G is abelian. So if somehow you've hunted around inside your group and you happen to have come up with an element, at least one, but one is sufficient, that has the property that when you look at the cyclic subgroup generated by it, you get the whole group. In other words, if the group is a cyclic group, then necessarily it's the case that if you take any two elements in the group, that they commute. The intuition is not too bad behind that. Look, to say that I have a cyclic group means that every element in the group can be written as, well, either the identity or g to some positive power or g to some negative power. But in our notation, it just means that every element in the group can be written as g to some power. If the power happens to be negative, then it just means that you've looked at the product of a bunch of inverses of g. If the power happens to be zero, it means you're just looking at the identity element. It's no big deal. So the proof is actually pretty easy. Proof, let's see. How do you show that something is abelian? You have to convince me that if you take any pair of elements in there and you do their 
operation in one order that you get the same thing as doing it in the other order. Well, let's see. G is cyclic means, this is the definition, means that there is some element, some, I don't care what it looks like, let's call it little g, having the property that if you look at the cyclic subgroup generated by g, you get everything in the group. That's what it means to be cyclic, that there's some element so that when you run through all of the powers, positive, negative, and zero of this particular element g, that you get everything in the group. All right, now, that's the hypothesis. The conclusion I'm trying to draw is that g is abelian. In other words, if I take any two elements in here and I combine them in either order, that I always get the same result. So let's see, here's what we want to do. Now pick any two elements, let's call them x and y, in the group G. Here's what we have to show is that x star y is y star x. You're thinking, well, I don't have a chance. Well, you do have a chance. Here's why. Look, anything in the group, oh, looks like G to some power. That's what it means to be cyclic group generated by this particular element. But uh, G equals the cyclic subgroup generated by G means that if you take something in the group, that you can write it as G to some power. Let's call it I for some integer I. In fact, I'll write it this way, folks. For some element of capital Z, remember capital Z denotes integers positive, negative, or zero, and that's precisely what X has to look like. If it looks like G star G a bunch of times, then I is positive. If X happens to be the identity element, I is zero. If X happens to be G inverse star G inverse a bunch of times, I happens to be negative. That's no big deal. And similarly, Y is G to the J for some integer J. And so now let's compute. Let's compute. And you still may be thinking you don't have a chance because you have no idea what G looks like or what capital G looks like or what anything looks like. Yeah, but wait a minute. What's X star Y? It's then G to the I, G to the J. But wait a minute. G to the I star G to any power is G to the property of exponents if you want, or just property starring with G. Again, this should look familiar. It's what you teach your eighth graders on how to multiply, right? On how to multiply exponents. G to a power times G to another power as you add the exponents together. And similarly, if I do Y star X, I get G to the J star G to the I. So that's G to the J plus I. And that's equal to G to the I plus J Y since addition in Z is commutative. Boy, that's getting down to basics. Folks, these expressions in the exponents are just adding whole numbers. It's not anything with the operation in the group or anything like that. The way that you combine G to the I star G to the J is you just add the two exponents together. And that's all we did in each case. In the first case, it's that plus that. In the second case, it's that plus that. But obviously, those two are the same, so check. So y star x equals x star y. x star y, y star x, and we're done. y star x. And the conclusion is that the group is an abelian. So the phrase is this. Every cyclic group is abelian. Every cyclic group is abelian. This is a nice situation where your math 215, your logic course comes in. But the converse is not true. Exactly right. It's not the case that every abelian group is cyclic. Here's an example of an abelian group that's not cyclic. So not conversely. So warning. And I'm not sure why students have a little bit of trouble with this warning. The converse is not true. Is not true. There are many, many abelian groups which are not cyclic. not cyclic. Here's an example. Example V. Yeah. 
I mean, there's also obviously many groups that aren't cyclic. If I hand you a non-abelian group, it has to be not cyclic by what we just proved, kind of hard to do it. But if I hand you an abelian group, it still might not be cyclic, like Z isn't. Let me give you another somewhat more interesting example. If I hand you the group of rational numbers under addition, Rational numbers under addition is not cyclic. So it's the group of fractions under addition. So, you know, I'm including zero here. That's fine. The operation now is plus. Certainly in a and group addition of rational numbers, you're perfectly mutable. That's no big deal. The claim is, is it's not cyclic, and let me just walk you through the idea. The claim is that it's impossible to pull out a single element. I don't care which element you pick. But if you pick out a single element and you look at the cyclic subgroup generated by it, it's impossible to get all of the rational numbers. You'll get a bunch of them, but you'll never get all of them. And the reason is this. If you hand me any rational number, well, it looks like A over B, where B is not zero. You can choose B to be positive if you want. And the claim is if you look at the identity element of this group, which is zero, if you look at the element that you've chosen, that's A over B, and A over B plus A over B, that's 2A over B, and A over B plus A over B plus A over B, that's 3A over B, and da 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 and then all of its inverses, which is all the negatives, then in effect, folks, what you've got is all of the elements of Q that look like some multiple of the original element that you started with. And the claim is that that can never give you all the rational numbers, and there's lots of different proofs. The one I like the best is this. Look at your denominator B. Tell me what primes make B up. In other words, write B as a product of primes. There's infinitely many primes. Pick your favorite prime that doesn't appear in the factorization of B. There's always at least one. In fact, there's always at least infinitely many of them. Just pick one. Then look at the rational number 1 over P. And it turns out that you'll never be able to write a multiple of A over B as 1 over P because the prime P just won't work out for you. Okay, so there's one of many possible proofs that Q is not cyclic. I'll just, I won't ask you to write that out formally for me, but just the idea is that for any uh, A over B in Q, if P is a prime, and I'm going to start denoting the prime numbers by capital P with an extra line in it, the set of prime numbers, those that don't factor non-trivially, then you can show that, oh, uh, if P is a prime number which doesn't appear in the factorization of B, appear in factorization of B, of B, then it's not too hard to show, and I'll leave out the details here, but the point is that this particular fraction is never in the subgroup generated by that element. If you think about it, just size-wise, I guess. Uh, size-wise, not a good way. Uh, just you wind up using the fundamental theorem of arithmetic or unique factorization of integers that if you try to write 1 over p in the correct form, you'd get a contradiction to the uniqueness of factorization in the All right, questions, comments? So there are lots of cyclic groups that aren't abelian. Here are the, I'll say the most important ones, and then I'll actually use the word that we used last uh, Wednesday, and then we'll call it a break. Uh, here are key examples, examples of cyclic groups. We've already given one. Z sub 6 was an example of a cyclic group. It turns out Z sub n, and I'll just remind you what the operation on Z sub n is to make it into a group, addition mod n for any n. It's a cyclic group. So the specific example we wrote down is Z sub 6. It turned out to be a cyclic group. In fact, Z sub 6 had generators 1 and 5. It will be of interest later on to try to write down how many generators each of the Zn groups have. But at least to verify that each one is a cyclic group, all I need to do is pick out at least one element that acts as a generator, and that's easy to do. 
since for any n, z sub n is always the cyclic subgroup generated by 1. Because if you start with 1, then you do 1 plus 1, which is 2, and you do 1 plus 1 plus 1, which is 3, and you just get all the way to 0. It's no big deal. Uh, secondly, and this one's maybe a little less obvious, but certainly turns out to be a cyclic group, if you look at z, and here I'm not writing down an operation because it's always understood when I'm talking about z as a group that the operation is addition. Z is cyclic. Reason? Well, what's the cyclic subgroup generated by, how about 1? You, and this is why I place cyclic subgroups up this way. Cyclic subgroup generated by an element is, by definition, the following. You automatically throw in the identity element of the group. You throw in the element. You throw in the element started with itself. Then 1 plus 1 plus 1. Then 1 plus 1 plus blah, 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 da, da, da. But then you start over. And you put in, by definition, the inverse of the element that you started with. There's its inverse. And the inverse starred with itself, and the inverse starred with itself, starred with itself, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this one's a little bit maybe uncommon because in all of these other examples, when you started with this particular element, all you had to do was start walking through its powers, and eventually you got all the elements of the group because you wound up getting back to zero by looking at powers. Here, you start with this element, and if you keep looking at it starred with itself, you never get the identity element back. But that's okay. Because the definition of a cyclic subgroup is, hey, if you don't get the identity element, that's fine. I don't care. Now go back and throw in all of the quote unquote powers of the inverse of the given element. So there's a generator for z. And all I had to do was write down one element that works. In fact, there's exactly one other element that works as a generator. Here's another generator. One is a generator. Minus one is also a generator, are the generators. I only need one in order to establish that z is a cyclic group, but this one happens to have two. The number of generators in z sub n is going to depend on n, and we'll talk about that next Monday. Okay, questions there, comments? Now, here's the statement. Theorem, proposition, result. I'm going to use this phrase. I'm not going to require you to fully understand exactly what it's meaning yet, but when we get to all the details of what isomorphism means, and we've opened this can of worms already by some discussion that we did last Wednesday, up to isomorphism, the groups Zn, n in n, in other words, the cyclic groups having n element and z are the only cyclic. So it's sort of interesting. If somebody tells you they have a cyclic group, however they've determined that, I don't know. It doesn't matter. And they tell you how many elements are in the group, then in effect, you know what the group is. They may not have used the lettering 0, 1, 2, 3, up through n minus 1. They may have labeled it using other expressions. But in the end, their group will be exactly one of those groups and you can determine exactly which group it is just by figuring out how many elements are in there. So for example, so proof, I'm going to omit this, omitted. It would take us a half hour, so it's not beyond the scope of this course, but it's just essentially a lot of details in keeping track of elements, et cetera. The idea, though, is this. Example, here's a group. It's one that we've looked at before. The group 1 minus 1 i minus i. You're smiling because you've done the additional sheet from home this week Friday. Mm. Okay. So look, let's call this, I don't know, K or something like that. That's the name of the group. I'm just making it up for this particular example. Uh, K is cyclic. Why? Well, all I have to do is convince you that there's at least one element in there. I'm going to choose wisely. It's not the case that all elements work, but this one happens to. Why? Let's see. You put the identity element this, of this group in. There it is. You put the element you're interested in in. You put it star with itself in, which is i squared is 
negative 1. You put its star with itself, star with itself in. i cubed is minus i. And you put its star with it. Well, folks, hey, you're done. In fact, by default, you have to get something that you already got because there's only four elements in the group, and you've just written down this is all okay. So here is a cyclic group. It's got four elements. So it has to be, so this group K is isomorphic to whatever the cyclic group is on my list of all cyclic groups that happens to have four elements, in other words, V4, meaning that there is a way of labeling the elements of Z4 and labeling the elements of this group called K, and I think I may have called it something slightly different in the homework sheet, that's all right, so that when you write down the group table of each of them, they are indistinguishable, that you wind up getting the same group table. All right, questions there? Good deal, okay. Let's see, we got that, got that. Uh, yeah, let me conclude with one last property of cyclic groups, and that's this. What will be of interest are questions of the following flavor. Suppose somebody hands you a group. And suppose somebody hands you a subgroup of that group. The question is, if you know the group has certain properties, is it necessarily the case that the subgroup has those same properties? So the question phrased in sort of mathematic ease is, if you have a property of a group, is that property necessarily inherited by every subgroup? Well, let me give you a, sort of an obvious one. If the original group is abelian, then every subgroup has to be abelian because you're starting with the information that you take any two elements in the entire group and you do them in this order, then you get the same abelian in that. So the question is, does that same property necessarily hold in the subgroup? Well, yeah, you're taking the same elements, and so they have to have the same. So the property of being abelian translates to subgroups. The property of being not abelian doesn't necessarily translate to subgroups. It might or it might not, depending on which subgroup you look at. A good example is this group of four matrices. And the group of matrices, G, L, N, R, is not abelian. But the group consisting of these four matrices happens to be abelian. <coughs> So the property being not abelian doesn't necessarily. So that's the sort of idea. Here's a question. If the group is cyclic, and I hand you a subgroup, is the subgroup necessarily cyclic? I don't know. The answer turns out to be yes. So this is actually a, a relatively deep result proposition. That, again, I'm not going to give you the details of the proof because I think our time is better spent looking at more topics or more ideas. But the proposition is this. Uh, the property of being cyclic is inherited by subgroups. So I've given you the informal, but the way that the mathematicians would speak language. In other words, i.e., if G is cyclic and H is a subgroup of G, then necessarily H is cyclic. Proof omitted. So every subgroup of cyclic group is necessarily cyclic. And folks, that's definitely not an obvious statement. Not an obvious statement. But again, I'm going to leave out the proof, just for what it's worth, the flavor of the proof is essentially this. Take your cyclic group, so there's at least one element in there called G, with the property that every element in the group looks like this particular element raised to some power. In other words, the powers of G, positive, negative, or zero, gives everything in the group. Now what has happened is, presumably, you've been handed a specific subset of the group, namely a subgroup, and what you need to do is find inside that subgroup a special element with the property that everything in the subgroup is it to some power. And the algorithm for finding it, something that works, finding a generator for the subgroup is, all you do is you take the original element that generated the entire group and you start asking the following question. Is the original element itself in the subgroup? Well, if it is, then the subgroup is the original group. 
and you're done. Basically, because there is no group restriction. So that was easy. All right, now, if that's not in the subgroup, then you look at G star G. It either is or it isn't. If it is, what you can show is that G star G is a generator for the subgroup. And that's, I mean, it takes 20 minutes worth of work, but you can do that. And if that's not in, then you look at G star G star G, and, da, 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 and you, eventually you have to get something in there. That's the idea. So what that means is, as a consequence, and let's see, this is something that we somewhat mentioned in the number theory course. Uh, as a consequence, corollary, the subgroups of this cyclic group are of the form, the form NZ, or sum N. In other words, if somebody asks you to pick a subgroup of Z, then the punchline is, if you've been asked to pick a subgroup of Z, you can automatically view the subgroup as a cyclic subgroup. Because the original group, Z, is cyclic. Every subgroup is cyclic. So, well, what does it mean to be a cyclic subgroup? It means that you've got a special element in there with the property that when you look at all of its quote unquote powers, it's inside a subgroup. Okay. Questions? Comments? Good. This is a good place to call it quits then. Um, if you happen to have the homework that's due Friday, if you happen to have it with you today and you just want to turn it in today, that's fine. I will take it. Otherwise, it is due Friday at 4.30, 5 o'clock. I don't care. You can just turn it in. Friday afternoon sometime. SI session with Jen tomorrow, 4, 5, 4, 4.15 to 5.30. And uh, sorry for any misinformation. And uh, folks, this particular time, please don't make a special trip to campus to turn in your homework. If you want to fax it in, email me, and I'll give you the fax number, or it's 262-3605. I'm not writing that down on the board, Karen, for public consumption. 262 Three, six.